This is Christian Book Blurb, brought to you by author and songwriter Matt McClary. Get a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the lives of some of your favourite Christian authors. Hear about their books and faith. Also, why not check out my website, mattmcclary.com. This episode is sponsored by the devotional, The God Who Sees You, by Georgie Tennant. Available now on kevinmayhew.com. Hello and welcome to the Christian Book Blurb, where we like to encourage you in your discipleship one book at a time as we meet some amazing Christian authors and learn about their books, their lives and their faith. Well, I'm your host, Matt McClary. Thanks for joining me on this episode today. And on today's show, we're going to be discussing or talking about Seeing Miracles with Kevin Elliott. Um, Welcome, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's great to be here. Great to see you again. Yeah, it's really good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. Now, you've written a book called See Miracles. And so I guess the very first question um, I'd like to ask, especially for those listeners who who may not be, um, well, when I say may not be familiar with miracles, I guess when we talk about miracles, um, a lot of people come with all sorts of different assumptions and, and we kind of we, we can kind of miss each other sometimes if we don't first of all define what we mean when when we talk about miracles. So what is a miracle, Kevin? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, people often talk about it in two different ways, don't they? You know, like something really unexpected. Oh, it's a miracle he passed those exams. He never went to a single class. You know, it's that really unexpected thing happening. Also, it's like more often perhaps where they defy the laws of nature. So Oh, that Land Rover, he's been running that for a thousand miles. He's not even topped up the diesel yet. That's, that's a miracle. That, that just can't happen. So it's used in that sort of way. Um, I think as Christian terms, though, how I like to understand it is that it's doing something with the ability and the authority that humans don't normally have. So now when Jesus did a miracle, he took authority over sickness over adverse weather conditions over demons creating food and wine he he took authority over things that humans can't do so whenever we do something that humans can't normally do so we might just even pray for a migraine if the migraine suddenly goes as we pray for it or a leg grows out or you pray for the weather and it changes it whenever we're doing something that humans can't do then we're operating in the supernatural operating in the power of the holy spirit and that's what I would call a miracle. It's, it's when we're doing something that we, we wouldn't naturally be able to do in our human states. But I guess it's a flexible definition, really. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and so the next question, I'm sure you might have, well, you, if you've been in the world of miracles uh, for a while or sort of the, the supernatural or the work of the Holy Spirit, um, you will have come across this. Um, there, there's two schools of thought, aren't they? out there these days um some people say that miracles are just a thing that happened in the bible and they don't happen anymore um there's no such you know the supernatural stuff has stopped um and of course you then have those other believers who say um well it still happens today so in your opinion then kevin um do miracles still happen today yeah it's a good question because I also went to a Baptist church growing up that said um, that the miracles were for the time of the Bible and haven't happened since the Book of Acts. <laughs> it's all the cessation mm. theory, I think they call it. Yeah. Now, clearly, Jesus did miracles. He sent the twelve out. They did miracles. The seventy-two sent out. They did miracles. We see miracles throughout the Book of Acts. But then, when we look at church history, we see quite a strong record of miracles happening right throughout the early Christendom. Uh, through the Middle Ages and right up right up to today, um, we, we, we still hear of and experience miracles and, and they're well, they well documented. Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously, right, writing a book on seeing miracles, I believe in miracles. <laughs> We're very fortunate yeah. to um, probably only over the last 10 years uh, see miracles. Before that, I would have probably been more of the school of thought that, and brought up in that culture that is not really something I'm expecting is not really relevant to me. So, yeah, I still did a lot of Christian work, but I wasn't seeking after miracles. It wasn't something that was really in in that sort of church culture that I was in at the time. But Jesus That's said, didn't he, you know, I 
he said, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I'm doing, he will do even greater things. And I suppose the debate has been, well, was Jesus telling the truth? Yes, because <laughs> Jesus wasn't a liar. So we've got to, we've got to take those words seriously. And, and the question is, did, was that just for followers of New Testament times or was that followers of, for all time? And there's nothing in the Bible that would say that that's just for New Testament times. So we have to assume that when Jesus said, you will do the works that I'm doing, even greater things, then there's an implication to all of us to think, mm, what does that mean for me? Can I do greater things than him? Um, or can I do those things? Uh, Paul said, said in the, uh, to him, by the power, by means of the power working in us, is able to do so much more than we can ever ask or even think of. So that's in those words of Paul, there's that implication that the Holy Spirit is going to enable us to do things we can't even dream of or think of. Um, yeah, I suppose. I suppose for us, it's interesting what you said about your early, um, your early kind of life in your christian walk um it's almost like there's a sliding scale isn't there on one extreme no miracles don't happen on the other extreme yes of course they happen all the time um but i guess for me and and for a lot of people somewhere on that sliding scale and, and what you were expressing earlier on um before you you properly sort of got got into this 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 area which we'll come to your story in a moment um is that, well, yes, miracles happen because the Bible says they do, but I don't actually really expect them to happen in mm. my life. Or, you know, mm. when I go to church on Sunday, you know, we're both living in the UK, so you go to your average standard UK church. I don't really expect to see miracles when I go to church. We're going to sing good songs and we hope that there'll be good coffee and, you know, we might pray for each <laughs> other. But... But, you know, are, are we going expecting miracles? Well, I don't know. Do, do you think, have you found this in your experience? Yeah, I'd say that getting good coffee in the church would be a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a coffee lover. Um, that's a new chapter for your for the next Yeah, book. that's yeah. it. We'll work on that. The, the coffee miracles. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of, one of the motivations for, for writing the book was to... Um, raise faith in that area because I think when you're in a culture in a church culture um, that doesn't expect miracles or doesn't teach miracles um, then you need to hear from another source <laughs> that miracles are happening I mean in our church and I guess in a lot of other churches that ministry time after church where you pray for people for healing is, is quite normal you know we do that every week and I know a lot of churches have prayer times after the services but some churches obviously don't do that um, and my hope that with the book is that by telling the stories where you can hear about God doing miracles right now you know not 10 50 100 years ago but right now doing miracles that will release faith so that you will then step out and find out more even pray for people yourself give it a go and then you start getting your own stories and then you start growing your own faith in that area so you go on a, a faith journey into miracles but somewhere it's got something's got to spark that off. Um, yeah, that whole power of testimony idea. That yeah. you know, th this is this is what's happening. This is what God's doing. Um, yeah, I'm I suppose in. partly part of the spark for me um, was what happened in uh, Qumran. Uh, was it, I can't remember what year it was now. Two thousand fourteen, something like that. Fifteen, where I went down to a uh, friend's church. Um, they'd had quite an, an, an unusual time where a guy had been prayed for in their prayer meeting was in a wheelchair and a bolt of lightning came into this guy of the Holy Spirit. He jumped up from the wheelchair, lifted this really heavy contraption above his head and started running around. And then there was like an outpouring of healing. It was called a revival, but it was really a healing revival. And they were having meetings every night down in Qumran um, to start with. And, and then it moved up. I was going when it was twice a week. But this sort of warehouse, it was ex-drug addicts that had gone through um, tri Bible training and be become ministers and were running this church. So it's quite, an, <laughs> quite a mixed bunch there, if you like. And it was incredible. You know, there were just so many people being healed every night. And there were lots of um, tes testimonies of how they've been ratified by the doctors. And yes, the cancer's gone and et cetera, et cetera. And people 
getting their sight back and various things. Um, well, one story I'd like to tell is that a lady that stood near me, she, even just during the worship time, she disappeared for a bit, then came back, then went up on stage and she shared that she'd been a prostitute. She'd had these sort of dodgy tattoos on her leg. And that during the worship time, she felt a leg burning, went to the toilet to see what was happening. The tattoo's completely gone. And she got up on stage to share it. So there was these miracles happening in funny and, and extraordinary ways at, at Cumbran. And I'd, I'd always had a sort of desire, I think, to see people well. But when I saw that these guys were praying so effectively for healing, I just wanted it. <laughs> and my mate would say, we want this. We were begging, you know, like, we want to be able to pray for people for healing. Because it's horrible when your friends and your family are sick and, you know, you just feel compassion for them and you can't do anything about it. And, you know, I want to do those things that you did, Jesus. You know, I want to do greater things. And I think for me, that sparked it off. And I think at, at the time I was in a Baptist church and the minister also came down, lady minister. So she was inspired by that. So we were, we were, we were given space at the end of the service to start praying ourselves for people to heal. And then we started seeing some healings ourselves out at the end of that church service. Um, but and that, I suppose, you know, that's probably eight, ten years ago now. Um, and that, that, that started your journey off. off to what sort of the, 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 the quite a big chunk of your book, See Miracles, talks about is um, your mission work um, in the country of Macedonia. Um, what can you tell us about that? Hmm. Well, Macedonia, uh, it's a beautiful country. You may not have heard of it, a lot of people. So I, I just say, it's, it's, if you're old enough, it's former Yugoslavia, uh, right in the, the bottom bit. It's uh, landlocked, about the size of Wales, it's a population of two million, so similar size. Uh, but it's a third Muslim. It's two thirds Macedonian Orthodox. It's less than 1% evangelical. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not an easy mission field. Let's just, just say that. <laughs> you get a lot of opposition out there. But it's a, uh, it's eighty percent mountains, um, so it's got things like the brown bear and the Balkan lynx and some crazy animals like that. The wine and honey is exceptional, uh, and it's got Europe's only ruby mine, so it's oh, it's wow. a little bit unique. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, it's a it's a land where Paul you had a vision of the man from Macedonia, is it, Acts sixteen nine, and the man said, "Come over and help us." Um, and uh, although the Borders of Macedonia were different in those days. It was much bigger. So it includes parts of what's now Greece, like Thessalonica and Philippi. Nevertheless, the whole area that we're in, in North Macedonia, um, would be where Paul would have been there. Um, and it's just nice to feel that we are, in some ways, you know, walking in the footsteps of Paul and trying to do some work where he was working. Um, but that's Macedonia. It's a beautiful country. And actually, when I started a prayer meeting up about 2016 with a, with a friend, the one I've been down to Cambrian with, actually, because uh, he moved house. And he advised another lad along. And this chap had read that verse, Acts 16, 9, and decided he, he was being called out to Macedonia and just took a plane and went out there and met uh, a Nigerian evangelist called Brother Jimmy, who's been planting churches out there. Um, so he started sharing this and we started praying at our prayer meeting for Macedonia. And that's how my involvement in Macedonia started. Uh, and within a year, we'd, we'd set up a charity to be able to enable us to, to give money out there and to support a network of about 25 small evangelical churches right across the country. Um, we support the pastors. We support uh, some of the poorest people, like food parcels and fuel. Uh, we go out there. We do a, a conference every Easter um, that they asked us to set up called New Hope, um, which is for, again, the churches right across the country. Um, we go around sharing in churches, doing outreach in villages, in fields. <laughs> and, um, yeah, sometimes just dropping off in people's homes and being invited in and then praying with them. Um, so, yeah, that's that's our, our ministry mission in Macedonia, um, which we've been doing for about six, seven years now. That's great. At the end of the um, podcast, we'll we'll share um, website addresses and things. So if listeners mm. want to find out more about Mission Macedonia and also where to find your book, they can look at dip into those links um near the yeah. end of the show um but just coming back to macedonia then you mentioned lots of miracles and things that happened mm. um when you were there do any particularly sort of stick out in your mind that, that you can share oh, with some of our listeners matt there's some yeah there's, i mean just so, so many amazing things we've seen but i'll just share a couple of more recent ones yeah uh, perhaps i don't normally share these but there was one uh, the last conference we did 
um, New Hope Conference, there's a man that we call the man in the bright orange jacket <laughs> to distinguish yeah. him. We didn't get his name. Because we always give a time, about two hours at the end of our conference day, for people to come forward and have prayer. We make a gospel appeal. We see lots of people give their lives to Jesus. And this guy, he shared that he had this terrifying dream one night in which Satan appeared. And when he woke up, he was partially blind and he had to get himself some really strong glasses. And he also had hearing problems and stiffness in his fingers as a result of all this. Um, he came to the conference. He gave his life to Jesus and the team prayed for him to, first of all, to break off the curse that came out of this dream. And then after they prayed, he was able, he took his glasses off and could see perfectly. Uh, they prayed some more, his hearing improved, and he got full movement back in his fingers. So that's the sort of thing that you know, happens uh, with, with individuals. Uh, but I went out a second time last year. I, I want to share today a little bit about these guys, because we go to some Roma villages, which are you know, really desperate places, I'd have to say. Uh, they're some of the poorest places you'll see in Europe. Uh, but there's one lovely family there. Uh, and a few months before we, got, we visited them in their home, the, the little girl who was four years old, she woke up one day in, in the morning at breakfast, sat up right in bed and started singing Word Perfect, More Love, More Power. Now, none of the family had ever heard this song before, including the girl. Uh, so her dad Googled it, found out that it was a worship song and, and shared that with a local pastor, this girl. Uh, now, when, I, when, we, when we visited her, she was... The, the grand old age of five and she said oh can I sing you a song and she sang us this beautiful song the first verse was in English the second in Hebrew the third verse in Arabic <laughs> and she only wow. speaks Macedonian I think how is this happening but her mum had been a Muslim uh, not long before that but she was dying of cancer it was quite aggressive and her distant cousin was the pastor and he said well if you come to the church we'll pray for you you know and it was a brave thing for her to do, but she went to the church. He got his wife, pastor's wife, prayed for her, and Jesus completely healed her, and all the doctors were amazed. Now, so this lady then becomes a Christian at the back of this. Her mother dies, so she goes to the funeral with her husband, and as her husband sat in the mosque, he receives the gift of tongues, actually sat wow. there in the mosque, and then he's praising God under his breath, you know, joy, during the funeral. Uh, so when... When we went there on the last trip, this is this has all happened, and I was doing a, we we're doing a service at the, their church, and, and I invited people forward for healing prayer after the service. And the pastor's wife was having uh, chest pains and difficulty breathing, so I started praying for her. But then the lady, the next mum, she steps forward, and she then starts praying in tongues over the pastor's wife. I thought I'm just going to let her get on with it, <laughs> so I stood back. And she's praying there, and the and the pastor's wife was healed. I mean, her, her, her breathing improved and her, her chest pains went. And it was so beautiful because, you know, it wasn't, wasn't very long when it was the other way around. You know, the, the pastor's wife was praying for her and she was healed of cancer. And now she's praying for, uh, mm. she was a Muslim at that time. Now she's praying in the power of the Holy Spirit and the pastor's wife's being healed. So these mm. are some of the sort of things we're, we're seeing and enjoying, really. Um, some really amazing stories. I suppose for some listening to these, they might think, oh, that, that's just so unbelievable i don't believe it yeah. um but i suppose um it, it comes back to the bible doesn't it and and the supernatural i mean the bible the bible's a supernatural <laughs> book and with filled with supernatural stuff <laughs> and i don't know we've kind of got to this p point where you know we kind of could talk about it or, or hear sermons about you know christmas and and easter um, and kind of go, oh, yeah, that's what happens. You know, give me my Christmas present or, or where's my, my chocolate egg? And and then we do, that, that's it. it. It's so normal. But actually, if you think about it, the, these are amazing, supernatural, miraculous things that, that we, we kind of just accept just sort of as a throwaway almost <laughs> that when we are then confronted with with other supernatural yeah. events, it's kind of like, well, oh, I find that really hard to believe. Uh, how did we get here? Yeah, you said that phrase, isn't it? Are we, um, you know, are we physical people having a super supernatural experience, or are we supernatural beings having a human experience? And you know what you're saying there is really we're humans, and we get this a oh, little bit. Of, look at the supernatural Easter. Look at the supernatural Christmas. But actually, you know, we are spiritual beings 
Um, and, and God wants to work through us, you know. It's that verse I shared earlier about him doing so much more we can, than we can ever ask for or think of. Well, those things that I, I just shared, I would never ask for or even thought of those things 10 years ago. And, yeah. I, and I, I quite understand people not believing what I say. And that's why in the book, I just try and be as open and honest about where prayers are answered, where prayers aren't answered, the difficulties I've had in coming to terms of all of this. And the fact that most, a lot of people, when I get back, they don't, they don't believe it. They, they, you know, you think well, they, they want to rush off and come out on a mission trip, but they just think, ah, yeah. you're making that well, up. That, 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 that kind of brings that. me to my, my next question, really, um, which I suppose sort of is, a, is another area where skepticism or doubt sort of might come mm. in. Um, what happens if someone doesn't get healed? I mean, mm. you know, surely if you pray for healing, that's it. Everyone should get healed. But mm. but we know in practice and real life that that mm. doesn't always happen. So how does how does that work? And how do we reconcile that sort of theologically or with our faith? Or am I not having enough faith? Or is it a, is it my fault? Is it their mm. fault? Uh, yeah, is it yeah. anybody's fault? You know, is it is it a fault at all? I don't yeah. know. Lots of questions yeah, yeah. around this yeah, not yeah, healing. Probably, what do you think? Especially when you start off praying for healing and praying for miracles, you, you're going to see a lot more not happen than do happen. <laughs> um, I, I think in Macedonia, you probably see, I don't know, perhaps more than half of the people that we pray for healed, I would think. Um, probably le- probably uh, less in England. It, but, um, we, yeah, some people don't, literally people don't get healed and we, and we have to uh, accept that. There are, I think there are lots of reasons. I try and, uh, address this in the books. So it's a really important question, and some even say, "Well, I shouldn't be praying for people for healing because if they're not healed, then it will damage them mentally or their or, or their health." And and they point to people who have been wonderful Christian evangelists that have got lost their limbs or whatever, you know, and and God uses them in that way, and that and that's true, He does. Um, but I can't help feeling that for most people, long term sickness isn't God's best for us. You know that God wants to show love and healing to people. There are a number of issues why a particular person you pray for might not be healed. Uh, I think if you've got no faith and I've got, and the person's got no faith in that healing, God can still heal that person. You know, I've seen that happen. And there's good examples in the Bibles of both actually. Um, but um, I also think that the, if you have more faith and that's where reading it about it then seeing it and then trying it and then seeing more miracles this is where your your faith grows the more faith you have the more you expect and then the more you you, you see um I, I again i don't think necessarily the person needs to have faith that they're going to be healed um it can ha- it can help if they do again um it can help that also it's a little bit about you know do you you only you won't do the way you do it um some prayers you know, you do need a bit more experience in how you pray for that person, particularly if there's something hidden. So I'll give you one example. There was a lady that came to me and she'd had pain in her legs, both legs, quite severe pains for 10 years. And the doctors are given all sorts of help and there there was no no healing. And I said to her, what happened 10 years ago? And, and this, this is where if you can get used to praying to God and listening to God and hearing his voice and work at that, that really helps you when you're praying for people. Um, I just sent there was something deeper and I said, she said, well, 10 years ago, my husband died and I saw him, I saw him die. And I realized at that point there was a trauma. There's a trauma that happened that has affected her health. So then you have to pray against the trauma. A bit like the, the, the example I showed where the guy had that dream. My team had to pray that off him. So you pray off the trauma and it could also be something satanic or it could be some experience they've had. And when you've dealt with that, the history of it, put Jesus back in and healed that. I did that first. When I felt that she was released from the trauma, then I prayed for her legs and, uh, and her legs were healed. Um, so there is, there is something about some experience in there. But if you haven't got that experience and you only get that by learning and keeping on praying and, and learning from experience, um, then you can still pray for people. Uh, there's still a lot, of, lot of, a lot of people you can still pray for uh, and, and see healings. And I think another, it's another, also... Another, sorry, you got, carry on. No, I just another, another point is that, that it may for that person, Matt, not be God's priority at that time. You know, although physical healing is important, 
the fact that we need spiritual healing, that we need to be saved, um, is more important. It's more important. And that, or maybe that, so that's for non-Christians, there may be something more important for them at that time. But for us Christians, well, it may be that we've got something to learn through a period of suffering, that, that the healing's not meant for us exactly at this time. So there may be something about that as well, God's priority for the person. Um, but there's also this realisation that we're in this spiritual battle. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians, isn't it, that the, our struggle's not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers, against world forces. And there's something about the kingdom of God is here, because Jesus has come, but it's still coming. It's, it's the now and the not yet. You know, we're not yet in the time when Jesus comes again. So we're in a period where we're going to see God in power working, but it's not going to be the final, it's not the final picture. So we're not going to see every skirmish one. You know, we might we might have the final battle one, but some of those local skirmishes we're going to lose. Um, so that I think the whole area of unanswered prayer is a bit complicated, but there are there are definitely reasons why sometimes you see answers and sometimes you don't. And then also there's a mystery about it, which is my sort of get out clause. We don't know the ways of God and why he heals some, and why he doesn't heal others. But I don't think that's an excuse for not going for it. You know. Well, I was just going to say that I guess it, it comes down to what we define as success yeah. um, in this area and also sort of in all of life, really. Um, I guess when, when you pray for someone to be healed, immediately we think, okay, this, the successful outcome is that they are healed. But actually, you know, I don't know that that may not be the successful outcome. It yeah. might be, you know, cause, cause God, God doesn't say, um, well done, my good and successful servant. You've healed 4,000 people in my name or whatever. He says, good and faithful servant. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Yeah. Are we being faithful? to yeah. god are we are we doing what he's asked us to do exactly. and and leaving the rest up to him and you know praying for the sick jesus tells us go and pray for the sick he tells us to do other stuff as well um you know but are we being obedient to that exactly. and actually the obedience is the success and you know the the the, the rest of it is up to him and so sort of yeah. say, oh, well, I'm not going to do it in case it doesn't work. Well, I guess that that's sort of missing the the success point, isn't it? Yeah. We, we, yeah. Wanting, we wanting the person to get up out of their bed and, or, or chuck their wheelchair, you know, in the bin or whatever, um, which, would be, which would be great. But the, the successful part for us and also for them, because I think it was in your book. I don't know. I read so many at the moment. Um, I think it was in your book where it, it's talking about um, the the faith element in, in it all and how you're stepping out in faith and obedience to pray for the person, mm. but they are also stepping out in faith and obedience coming to ask yeah. for that prayer. Yeah, quite, so, yeah. so there's, there's an obedience on their part. There's an obedience on your part yeah. and, and, and we're obeying God. Um, yeah, right but, there, there's the success, even before anything sort of supernatural 100%. happens or not. Yeah, and I think what we've done now as well, what we do now and encourage the team to do is to, we say, well, look, go out and, and ask them what they want Jesus to do. Because there was got, getting to a point where some people were, oh, the English are coming. I'm going to get the English to pray for me, to, to heal me. You know, so, w so we say right now, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And they say, oh, well, I've got. I've, I've got partial hearing in my, de in my left ear. I'd like it healed. Okay, well, ask Jesus and we'll see what Jesus does. And then when they're healed, we thank Jesus for what he's done and seal that. And if he's not healed, we, we thank Jesus anyway <laughs> for loving us and we, we send them away with a blessing. So it sort of takes you a bit out of the equation. Now, I only say a bit out of the equation because it is still heart rendering when you're praying for some desperate people. And <clears throat> in the book, I mentioned some what might be seen as dramatic failures. You know, that the one story of the lad was completely paralysed whilst I was preaching on the paralysed lad through the roof and he's not healed at all. But even then, in, the, in these situations where he's crying, you're crying, and it's really hurting, that there's no healing. You know, you're, you're, on that day, I was obedient. You know, I, I, I believed it was the right thing to do. I prayed for him, he wasn't healed. And almost that, that hurt, that pain of not seeing answered prayer, I think is part of 
the cost of, of having a healing ministry. It might sound bizarre, but yeah. it, it, because it, sh- it shows that you're obedient and you're not just doing it for like human recognition or human success, but you're, you're doing it because God's told you to do it, whatever the outcome is. Um, and, and that's, yeah. And someone also said once, don't, don't pray for three people and tell me healing prayer doesn't work. Pray for a hundred people, then come back and tell me it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, there's a little bit about persistence and patience and, and building your faith up in that journey, really. And um, Kevin, we've been speaking loads about your um, your book, um, See Miracles. There's so much more packed into your book. Um, so if listeners have um, have been you know interested by some of our discussion, we, we've literally only just started scratching the surface of um, what you've written. And I must say, having read it, it's written in such a conversational style. I really enjoyed it. And it kind of swept me along and, and wanted me to keep reading. So so thank you for that. Um, so do check out Kevin Elliott's book, See Miracles. We'll be back chatting more about with Kevin um, about his faith and his life um, after these. The God Who Sees You by author Georgie Tennant is a series of 30 reflections to help us overcome the uneasy feeling that plagues so many of us, that we are unseen, unacknowledged, unloved, and misunderstood. As Georgie Tennant takes us on a journey from the Old Testament through to the New, she examines the stories of a variety of biblical characters, some household names and some unheard of, who felt these things too as they encountered a God who saw them, understood them, and called them higher. So too can you. Get your copy of The God Who Sees You from Georgie Tennant, available now from kevinmayhew.com. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, you can help keep it on the web. All you've got to do is buy me a coffee. Head over to buymeacoffee.com slash Matt McClary to make a donation. There is a link in this episode's show notes. So go on, buy me a coffee today and help this podcast to keep supporting Christian books and authors. Hello, welcome back to the Christian Book Blurb podcast. I've been chatting with author Kevin Elliott about his book, See Miracles. Um, Kevin, at this point in the show, we like to chat a little bit about the author. Find out a bit more about you. Um, so, so who are you? <laughs> what a question. Um, do you have any fun things that you like doing or favorite <laughs> things? I, I dreaded you asking me this, really. <laughs> I, I go to the gym every morning. I do do that. That's not fun. I support Bristol Rovers. That's not much fun. Uh, <laughs> I love What you. league are they in? They're in League One. Sort of right in okay. the middle. Okay, that's not uh, really fun. mediocre this season. Um, <laughs> yeah, I used to take a job as an 80s DJ. <laughs> in the 80s, I did play in a, a folk rock band, which was a predecessor to Eden Burning that some listeners might have heard back in those days. And in the 90s, I was one third of Stance that produced a Christian dance album called And the Angels Raved On, sort of based right, on the okay. 15 uh, angels uh. marching in heaven. Uh, and, and I ran an alternative to worship events and can people like find some of these songs on you know, Spotify? actually yeah so and the angels raved on by stance is on uh spotify and on there and uh all, all the eden burning stuff is quite widely out there i think yeah, um, yeah so nice. yeah but so, yeah check out stance if you like dance music dance worship music yeah it's a bit niche but if you're into that <laughs> check out and the angels raved on uh yeah i do love uh hanging out in coffee shops and when I lost my job and took early retirement, I um, did a part-time uh, voluntary work in a coffee shop and did the barista stuff. So, um, Okay. Favourite coffee shop then? Go on. Give us your oh, verdict. Well, uh, shout out to my local shop, Moosh and Black and Gold, independent coffee stores rock, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Really good. Um, so that that's the favourite thing to drink then, coffee, I guess. Mm, uh, uh, yeah. Not, I'm, yeah. You know, I do like the Macedonian wine. Oh yeah, yeah. On it. <laughs> and how about eating? Have you got like a favorite Macedonian meal, or, or is it something more closer they, to home? Uh, yeah, actually, they they do what's called a chorba, which is like a, a, a thick soup, um, and it's really nice to sit out, say ten o'clock in the morning, outside a cafe on a sort of tree lined street, eating a chorba. That's quite. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> mm. Yeah, wonderful. A bit too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you got any hobbies? 
that you engage in? You had the DJ stuff. Do you still dabble a bit in oh, spinning got... the decks? Or, uh, I don't do much have now. You got other I've hobbies? done a little bit in the past, but uh, I try and get out of doing parties and things like that. My own party, okay. some family parties I do. It's uh, got all the lights and things. Uh, yeah, not a lot to be honest, Matt. I play a bit of guitar and, uh, yeah. But I, 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 the, the, I enjoy, when I'm out on mission particularly, That I mean, I, that's my, I just love being out there. Most of the work is admin work and, and things like that, but I do love being out um, sharing Jesus and praying with people. That, 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 that's, that's fun. And, you know, I've been doing a bit more picked up the guitar a bit more recently and when I'm out there and done a bit more worship with people out there. So that, that, I enjoy that as well. Uh, I enjoy with children, part, I do children's work and that, working with children, working with homeless. Um, yeah, I just love meeting people and sharing with people, really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Apart from writing books and your mission work, do, do you have um, other other sort of forms of employment or are you retired now or is, is is writing books and the mission charity sort of take up all your time how, how does it work up, for you? yeah it takes up a lot of it i mean i have um so i go around speaking in, in churches and doing talk sermons and i have um a website called allaboutjesus.info where i make these talks into um video talks so they're all they're all 20 minute videos um and i try to do videos on every parable every miracle and every life event of jesus so that's been quite a mission in itself really yeah um, so i'm just i'm just putting together video number 95 wow well done <laughs> uh so that take, that takes time yeah i mean um i do some work with the church and obviously the charity work takes quite a bit of time and uh, and also the writing in between as well now so so yeah that's pretty much full, full time for me now uh, i've been left work three years so i've had to transition into this sort of new way of life but getting up early in the morning going to the gym helps it it kickstarts me (laughs) no great um what is the holy spirit doing in your life or or is put on your heart at the moment that you can share with our listeners yeah so i have got a a heart for reaching out to students which i've not done much of really so i'm praying into that i'd love to be able to go to university christian fellowships and because it's part of my own story. When I was at university, I felt quite inadequate as a Christian. I, I didn't feel God could use me. Uh, I, I was drawn back into the engineering side. At the When I was at, during my industrial periods, I'd be swearing and drinking. And when I was at university, I'd be into the Christian fellowship. I, I led, led sort of two lives. I wanted to be full on for God, but I was struggling. And then, you know, God brought this lady called Helen Rosevere along to one of our meetings really powerful Christian missionary speaker and another missionary organization the following week. And I got involved in mission work off the back of that. And it, it did change my life. And you know, I'd love to be able to inspire young people and young adults to um, check out mission work and, and push themselves out of their comfort zone. Mm. Uh, yes. That's one thing. I'd, yeah. I'd like that opportunity. I'm learning Macedonian. Um, so I'd love the opportunity to um, go into coffee bars and, wine bars and, and just talk conversationally in Macedonian. I don't think I'll get to the standard where I can is that it. is that easy to to find resources to help you do that? I mean so I know sort of Duolingo kind of does like I don't know the top twenty five yeah. languages in the world or something, but you know, finding Macedonian I imagine must be pretty tricky. So the only place I could find it was on a, an app called Memrise and I started writing my own program on Memrise, putting words in and, and recording voices out there. So I make my own app and then they've just They've just put the axe down on it, <laughs> so, you can, so there's nothing. So you can't get that to any, any courses, community courses they call it, on the app only on a website, which is a bit more difficult now. So right. I haven't lost my courses completely, but no, it is difficult. There's, there, there are no, there's no one out there that's doing um, language apps in Macedonia, but there are some books right. and you know things like that. But it's not easy when yeah. you're in England because there's no one, you don't hear the language. So yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's yeah. a oh, challenge. Well. You like challenges. Yes, I, I hope you rise to it and, and get there. But keep persevering. Thank you. Um, it's almost time to say goodbye. Um, it's been fascinating chatting with you. Um, but before we go, can you just give us and our listeners um, just where to find you? Are you on social media? You know, what about websites, about your, your mission, Macedonia organization, all of that? Where could people buy your books as well? Yeah, so the books are widely available on the normal sorts of channels. Uh, paperback ebook on amazon it's also on audible now the audio books out there um so the charity 
uh, you can contact us if you want to get involved on Mission Macedonia at Outlook.com. Um, the charity and book on the web, on the same website, which is www.missionmacedonia.com. So quite simple. Um, my all my talks about Jesus. Um, so my online ministry is all about Jesus. Info. So all about Jesus. Info, and you can contact me personally uh, on Kevin Elliott at gmx.co.uk. Wonderful. Thanks, Kevin. For the benefit of our listeners, I will be putting those two main website addresses, the allaboutjesus.info and missionmacedonia.com, in the show notes of this episode. So if you want to just click on that to go over to find out more about either of those things Kevin has mentioned, and also you can then email him and stuff through Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. If you're interested at all, anything I've said, even if you've got objections, please contact me. (laughs) That's absolutely fine too. I'm, I'm easy with that. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. It's been wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you for um, coming on the Christian Book Blurb um, and chatting all about your book, Sea Miracles. Thanks, Matt. It's been a pleasure. And a really big thank you to the sponsor of today's show, The God Who Sees You, 30 Inspiring Reflections by author Georgie Tennant. Go and grab your copy now from kevinmayhew.com. Thanks, Georgie. Thank you as well um, for listening to this episode. I I pray it's been um, inspiring and eye-opening and and maybe um, something started stirring in you um, from listening. So bless you. Thank you for listening. And don't forget, Christian Book Blurb comes out twice a month on the 1st and on the 15th. So I look forward to the pleasure of your company once more in just a couple of weeks' time on another episode of the Christian Book Blurb. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to Christian Book Blurb with your host, Matt McClary. Do give it a like, give it a share, and let your friends know all about it. We do hope to see you again soon on another Christian Book Blurb.